Pleasure to welcome to the program Joshua Landis. He is the Mackey Chair of the Center for Middle East Studies at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, Joshua, thanks for joining us. Yeah, it's a pleasure being with you, Sam. Let's. Um, can you just before we talk about the most recent events, um, can you give us a sort of a, a a timeline of where of what of how U.S. policy has evolved? devolved over the course of really uh, a, a little more than a decade now in terms of uh, of Syria. Right. Well, Syria has been, uh, the United States and Syria have been um, at each other's throats for a long time. Really, it goes back to 1948 and the war, um, Israel's war of independence in Palestine, in which Syria joined and supported the Palestinians and joined um in opposition to Israel. And this this caused relations between Israel, between Syria and the United States really to go south. And it's been a bumpy ride ever since. In 2011, the major uprising against Assad started and which turned into a civil war and Assad hammered the opposition. Very quickly, the United States thought that Assad would fall the way that Gaddafi did and the way uh, the Tunisian president had and and that this would be part of the Arab Spring, that democracy in the Middle East was a borning and that they could get rid of this thorn in their side. Um, no, my, my, but it didn't, turn Gaddafi, out, it didn't turn out so well. Gaddafi uh, fell as a function of, uh, of, US. of U.S. and uh, European a bombing, I think, uh, on some level, right? I mean, uh, right. essentially. You're right. Um, yes. And so when uh, in, in 2011, there was, I remember there was a very strong sort of like a neocon push to arm the 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 Syrian um, r rebellion, I guess. Uh, but what was problematic about that was being able to tell the different factions associated with that rebellion. There were, were some who were uh, ostensibly yes. um, pro-democracy forces and others who were um, more, I guess, uh, you know, militant uh, Islamist uh, uh, groups. And so what, what, when did we start actually like physically engaging in, uh, in that conflict? Right. President Obama was very reluctant to get America involved in the fighting. And he 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 said in 2011, September, we, he said, Assad should step aside. But the next sentence, which nobody remembers, was that, but America's not going to make him do it. So this was sort of a contradictory message. And it, it, it was emblematic of Obama's administration's policy towards Syria. They wanted Assad to fall. They hoped he would fall on his own as a product of this uprising, but they didn't want to get deeply involved. And that that led America into many problems in the future, because already in 2012, you see Secretary of Defense saying, you know, we, we don't want the Syrian army to collapse because the chemical weapons might get into the hands of Hezbollah. And then by 2013, Mike Morrell, the deputy director of the CIA, went on on 60 Minutes and um, and gave a long interview in which he said, we don't want the Syrian army to collapse or to be destroyed because Syria might break apart or even worse, that Islamist factions, the jihadists like Al Qaeda would take Damascus. And um, and that became the major fear that that the radicals were much stronger than the liberal Syrians they were had militias on the ground. They knew how to fight. They'd had experience in Afghanistan and Iraq and that they were going to win. So America turned really around and didn't want the army to fall. They wanted Assad to leave, but they thought the army might come to America for a deal if they weakened it enough. But they didn't want it to collapse. And and Mike Morrell, the deputy director of CIA, said at the end of this interview, um, he, 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 he said... We don't want to, you know the army to collapse because that would be the we're going to need the army to destroy Al Qaeda when this is done, and and that was that's the assessment of America. So America gave 
money to the opposition, gave arms to the opposition, wanted to weaken the Syrian army, but thought the Syrian army would come to America for a deal. And it didn't. Ultimately, the Russians stepped in in 2015 and the Syrians went to the Russians. They didn't go to the Americans, which was logical because Russia was their major. And I think America actually sighed a sigh of relief when the Russians entered in. They didn't say that, of course. They they clucked at you know their tongue at the Russians. But I think they were worried because ISIS by that time had become the dominant Islamist faction and it was at the doors of Damascus. And it, it, had ISIS taken Damascus, it would have been devastating for America. So, so I think Russia then and America had a division of labor. America decided we're not going to worry about Assad anymore. We're just going to uniquely go after ISIS. And we dumped the Syrian Sunni opposition that we had been supporting and we armed the Kurds. And we became partners with the Kurds who are our proxy military and still are today. We still own 30% of Syrian territory. And we left the Russians and Assad to go after Al Qaeda and the rest of Syrian opposition, including those militias that we had armed and trained. And so that, that led to Assad winning and it's where he is today. And uh, just to um, uh, and to clarify too, the the when uh, that shift happened, and I imagine these were you know some of these were lessons from the uh, Iraq and yes, how we had disbanded the the Baathist army, and that created, um, in some respects, it created a new enemy uh, for uh, well, I mean. It, for both the United States within the context of, of Iraq and um, and for the rest of of Iraq. Um, and but so when we um, uh, decided to stop arming uh, the Sunni uh, uh, uprising in uh, in 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 Syria, when did we insert troops? I mean, the troop numbers, if, if I'm not mistaken, are, are somewhere a little bit below a thousand troops. Um, right. Is, that's that's what that's what we're told. And there's a lot of contractors and others. We just had a, the Iranian an Iranian supported militia in Syria sent a uh, well, we don't know if it was in, it was in Iraq, actually sent a drone and killed one American soldier or wounded an American soldier, killed five contractors. So a lot of these a lot of the people working there are contractors. And I assume military people as well. And uh, do we know the numbers of, of contractors that we have deployed? We don't I mean, really. You know, people have guessing that there's around 2,000 possibly, uh, but there's about a 1,000 Amer American soldiers. That's usually the number that's given. And then, So it's not a lot. And we have, the, we, we have this big Kurdish-led military, the Syrian Democratic Forces. They were named by America, needless to say. And th they are staffed the higher... The, uh, the upper echelons are staffed largely by Kurds who look to America, who hope to gain, if not a, a great deal of autonomy, perhaps Kurdish independence. They call the region Rojava, which means Western Kurdistan. And, um, and, and, and they're, America is their protector. And the moment America leaves, they will have to make a deal with Assad who will, who will eliminate their independent militia and uh, bring them back under state control. And that's what they're worried about. Okay. And so the, and that's about, uh, you know, 30% of the territory up in, in the Northeast that um, yes. we are helping the, 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 the Kurds essentially uh, maintain there. So, yes. And it's um, got most of the oil. It's got most of Syria's oil, which we raised the Syrian army and with these Russian, uh, with Russian soldiers as well, they were they were um, militia men. They weren't part of the Russian army, and um, we we killed about two hundred Russians in a race for these oil wells. And America got them, as as ISIS, which owned them at the time, was collapsing. Everybody was trying to get the oil because they knew that was going to be key to sustaining the future of Syria. America got it, and that's what largely funds the Kurdish military in the northeast. So it's a very, it's it's not that much money for america to remain there um and uh so in 2020 
there uh the trump uh administration uh imposed the the caesar uh sanctions is that right right will Correct. you explain what those sanctions are and uh, give me your sense of uh you know i guess the, we can start to talk about those sanctions in the context of what's happening with the arab league as well absolutely and and there's a bill house resolution 3202 is sitting in front of Congress for a vote, maybe voted on this coming week, which doubles down on those Caesar sanctions. So it's very important. This is a, you know, this is at play now um, in Washington. The Caesar sanctions were designed to put sanctions, make it much easier to sanction people in Syria, um, and to impose secondary sanctions. That means sanctions on any person or entity firm that invested in Syrian reconstruction, in oil, energy sector. So a number of sectors of Syria were named and designated in order to keep Syria from rebuilding. The idea was that Assad would stay weak, the state would stay weak, and Syria would remain in ruins, which would make it a liability for Iran and particularly Russia. So America wanted to punish the supporters of Assad and keep the state very weak, which is the what the Caesar sanctions are designed to do. And um, and for the last you know five years, it, this they came in 2019, 20, and the Syrian currency collapsed. It, it's had a devastating effect on the economy. Now, of course, the war has had a bad effect. The collapse of the Lebanese economy has had an effect. There are uh, numerous factors that have caused this downward spiral of the Syrian economy. But the the Syria, the, the, the currency was really hammered by this. It had partially collapsed during the war, but it was really once the Caesar sanctions were imposed and Lebanon's economy collapsed. That it, it, and that devastated Syrians. 90% of Syrians today are living in poverty. Many are malnourished. The UN says it's a disaster. Uh, there's a lot of stunted growth amongst children in Syria because they're not getting the right food. And uh, and this, you know, ruins their brains and and uh, is going to have lifelong effects on this generation of Syrians. So now the Syrians, Caesar sanctions are only partially uh, responsible for that. But we saw the Arab states just this past month well, but before we relations. before before yeah. we get to that, I want to I want because um, the what what are I like the the rational I mean the idea that the U.S. government is not um, is not concerned about the suffering of the Syrian people is not a hard concept for me to grasp, frankly. Well, uh, it is we, it is concerned, and we are the largest single donor of humanitarian aid, but. The argument to, to Syria. Uh, OK, yeah. I mean, so we're 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 causing the suffering. We're ostensibly uh, trying to alleviate it to some extent. But what we're not allowing Syrian society to do is to rebuild a, a an economy and a civil society that can function to provide for its own people going Precisely. forward. And but Absolutely. what is it's like walking it's like walking past a homeless person on the street and you give him some money out of your pocket which is humanitarian aid but what he really needs is to get a house a telephone and ultimately be able to find a job and those are the things that Syrians want to do they want to be able to get back on their feet and rebuild their houses and rebuild their lives and today they can't uh, and it, there's no electricity. There's a, an, there's like two hours of electricity a day in most Syrian homes. Um, but what is we're freezing what is the, this winter? What is the yeah. end game? Like, what is the goal of uh, uh, sanctions like that? If I mean the, the, it seems that the United States accepts the fact that Assad is not leaving for power. I mean, it, it, if there was a a civil war where hundreds of thousands of people died. And it was not enough to drive him out of power. What are these sanctions supposed to achieve? Like, what is the end game of just inhibiting the ability of Syria to become a country that can sustain itself? 
You know, that's a super good question, Sam. And I, I don't, I don't know the real answer to it because it, it just becomes this negative policy. Uh, unfortunately, now s officially, Syria says, I mean, America says that it supports UN resolution. Five, four, oh, oh, two. I'm forgetting what the numbers now are. But it's a Syrian resolution that was a UN resolution that was passed in 2016, 15, that says that Syria should have a political solution to the civil war, that there should be free elections overseen by the UN, in which the opposition would be able to, you know, come to power, which is regime change, if you want, through legal means, and that's what America supports. So in other words, this leverage and sanctions are theoretically to produce this democratic outcome. But of course, we know that Assad has won. He, he's fought 12 years of civil war in order not to have a democratic outcome, and he's won the war. And now, um, you know, the Arab world, I think, understands this, and they want to move on and normalize. And the United States is digging in its heels. And, and that's why there's this resolution, House Resolution 3202, which is before the House this week. It's been passed through the House Foreign Relations Committee with both Democrats and Republicans supporting it, which doubles down on the Caesar sanctions and says that anybody who invests in Syria, that America, that not only will they be sanctioned, but America has to set up all of these oversight committees that will, that will monitor every investment transaction in Syria and anything that violates Caesar, that America will alert the Congress every year to who's investing in Syria so they can sanction them. And this, this means that the Saudis and the others who are trying to normalize with Syria are gonna be at loggerheads with America. And it puts us in an inimical stance to our closest allies. Uh, you know, Anthony Lake was just in Saudi Arabia trying to reassure the Saudis that we're on their side. But here we are, you know, going to hammer them on their Syria policy. And and that means the Saudis are going to. What does that do? It forces them towards China. It forces them towards looking for other countries, perhaps even Iran, to help them drive out the Americans and get sanctions lifted. I mean, how do you. It's a bad situation. Yeah. Uh I, I'm not as I guess I, I don't know how 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 horribly concerned I would be uh, to be alienated from from Saudi Arabia, frankly. But uh, but within this context, I guess I'm just trying to figure out what the United States motivations are, uh, because clearly Washington doesn't want to be alienated from Saudi Arabia. So what is the end game? Uh, we want to have some control over that oil, and so we'll allow. We yeah. will, we'll, we'll, we'll rescind uh, the 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 sanctions so that you can rebuild your country. But we get to maintain the control over those oil fields in in the Northwest. Is that enough of a uh, uh, like? I mean, what I, I just. Know I it's think hard to figure out the agenda, right? I the mean, agenda is we're punishing Russia. You know, the Ukraine war made it much more difficult to leave. Uh, Iran, we're at, you know, daggers drawn with Iran over this in nuclear enrichment. So we don't really want to give them a, a pass in Syria. Secondly, um, Biden withdrew from Afghanistan. He got a bloody nose for that. I think it was the right thing to do, but it was done sloppily and and everybody misunderstood Afghanistan so severely they didn't realize the Taliban was going to take over so quickly. And so it was a mess. He got a bloody nose and I think he just decided, you know, I'm not going to pull us out of Syria, even though Trump had tried, uh, because we have this relationship with the Kurds. It's going to be another thump as America leaves these you know, endless wars. And I think he's just kicking a can down the road. So there's there's that element. Um, and so that's, you know, that's what I think is happening is America just, America now under Biden does not have a special envoy to Syria. It really has, it's not worried about Syria. I think it's just doing damage control there. And, uh, and it, because if we really were to pull out and leave with our troops, the whole infrastructure of this 30% of Syria would be 
taken over by the Syrian army. And the leaders that we've cultivated and promised to defend would be out on their ear. Some of them would be put into the clink, others would be killed, but they, they would have to flee the country like, like the Afghans we supported. Of course, Afghanistan was a much bigger operation. There was thousands more people dependent on us, but still there, there are quite a few people dependent on us in Northeast Syria. And so uh, is that basically it? We're just going to, uh, we're just going to uh, try and essentially tread water in Syria, provide this humanitarian aid as some type of like, you know, Palliative. Band-Aid, Band-Aid mm-hmm. on, a, on a massive wound, I guess, that really we're inhibiting from healing, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's sort of the way it is. It, it is. Maybe not totally responsible, but we're certainly inhibiting uh, the, the healing of this. And ostensibly is this punishment that we are uh, giving uh, Russia and Iran, the, we're denying them the commerce that could be associated with their ally, you know, uh, Russian, bill, you know, uh, construction company contracts and uh, Iranian, I don't know, uh, sales. I mean, is that theoretically what it is? It's like we're yeah. we're trying to. It's just the economic knock-on effects of not having the opportunities in Syria that they would have. Right. We don't want to say we've lost, and and that's. You know, I was just on a uh, a panel um, with Jim Jeffrey, who was a special envoy under Trump. He would have been ambassador to Turkey. He's a longtime State Department. But he had really articulated our policy. And he, he said, you know, in 2020 or 19, he said, my task is to turn Syria into a quagmire for Russia and Iran. And, and he's, you know... He articulated just this last week, he articulated it as we don't want to allow the Assad regime to reassemble itself and to to restabilize itself. We're denying them this ability to do this. And that's what's important. We're not keeping Assad from his shrimp dinners or his palaces, but we are keeping the state weak. And I think that's just, you know, that's 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 the extent of it at this point. You know, there's I suppose that, some people hope that there will be democracy coming out the other end, but it's not going to happen. But isn't that also sort of a dangerous thing to do on some level in in uh in It is. That region, you know, the, the, I mean the Jordanian foreign minister just before the normalization of Syria with the Arab League, he was out there on the stump speech and he said the status quo is not working. It's immiserating the Syrian people. It's causing more refugees to leave the country, which of course are going to places like Jordan and Lebanon. They don't want that. Assad has turned to a drug trade. They're, the captagon trade, which is amphetamine, is being produced in Syria's drug factories, which used to be the, the sort of gold standard of, of Syrian industry, which was the drug industry, which it did very well and it produced cheap drugs, but that got largely destroyed during the war. But the know-how is there and it's turned to illegal drugs, which are flowing out of Syria. And so the Jordanians say, look, we've got to stop that drug trade. We've got to diminish the role of the Iranians and return refugees. The only way we're going to do any of that is by getting rid of sanctions, reestablishing some relations, diplomacy, and rebuilding Syria. And let Syrians, you know, these people who have been traumatized by this war, rebuild their lives. And then, you know, perhaps legitimate trade will be, we can use that as a negotiating tool to end the illegitimate drug trade. You're not going to get rid of Assad. And Assad's here to stay. That's what they all say. Assad's here to stay. We got to stop thinking about regime change. And we have to do the best we can um, and the status quo is not working. It's making things worse. And I and, think that's the that's the agreed attitude by the Arabs. And and, and it sounds as if uh, the Arab League deciding to normalize uh, relations with, with Syria is not really going to have any necessarily substantial material impact on Syrian society because they are all uh, afraid of these secondary sa- sanctions from the U.S. Um, yes. And it also sounds as if um, the Biden administration is not interested in really engaging 
in doing anything other than sort of treading water there uh, and that this move by the Arab League will not in any way sort of like pressure uh, the Biden administration enough to change their policy. I think you're correct. I think there are people in the Biden administration that would like to have the liberty to explore, uh, you know, see how the Arabs do with diplomacy. But uh, Congress, you know, look at Assad as a... Yeah. In Congress, you can't sell that. And there are lots of groups in Congress that want their congressmen to uh, double down on these sanctions. And, and Congress is moving forward with this bill. I think the administration would like it not to happen, but they, they, they're not going to fight for Assad. That's for sure. You don't think they they would ever veto uh, a, a bill like that? Do you think it has I, the ability? I don't think so. Well, yeah. um, it, it, it sounds pretty bleak, and we're just basically waiting for um, a crisis that is significant enough that it causes us to change our, our, our policy. Well, and you know, that almost happened during the earthquake that took place in northern, in, in southern Turkey, northern Syria. The U.S. immediately, almost, you know, within three, two days of the earthquake said, we're lifting sanctions for six months. That in, in August, that will be come to an end. Now, Saudi Arabia has come, it, it's been reported in a few newspapers, has come to the United States and saying, would you lift sanctions for another year in order to, so that we can, we can, continue to send aid and help Syria get back on its feet. And that's the kind of negotiation that's going on between the White House and the Arab League and Saudi Arabia. That's why this bill is being passed through Congress, because there are opponents of it who are trying to stop it through Congress. Because I think, you know, I think the administration would throw it on the table to Saudi Arabia as we negotiate over things like, you know, oil production and- right. Uh, Abraham Accords and other things that are much more important to the White House than Syria. But but Congress is trying to make sure, you know, that doesn't happen. When we say Congress, I mean, who are we talking about? Uh, is If they if this bill gets to the floor and gets a vote, is it going to get 500 votes uh, or 435 votes rather? Uh, or... I think it's going to get a lot. It's, you know, the name of the bill, I'm forgetting the name, but it's like the anti-Assad bill. So it's, you know, it's bringing justice to Assad type bill. And uh, that's the way it's being framed. And it's not going to bring justice to Assad. It's not going to hurt Assad. It will hurt the Syrian people. Of course, it it hurts Assad and his ability to reconstruct and to rebuild his state. That's true. Um, but that's that's the, you know, it's it's popular red meat for an American, you know, because Assad stands for everything that America hates. So one party state, a Ba'athist state, he's a minority religion on top of Syria. He's an enemy of Israel. He supports Hezbollah. You know, there's a long, he's, a, he's an Iranian client, if you will. There's a long checklist of things that we don't like about him. Well, uh, Joshua Landis, uh, Mackey Chair of the Center for Middle East Studies at the University of Oklahoma, thanks uh, uh, for uh, you spelling this out for us. Um, it seems a little bit bleak, and I guess we'll keep an eye on that uh, bill in Congress to see if it passes. Um, I imagine that there are uh, Syrian civilians who are, you know, <laughs> hoping that it doesn't to the extent that they're aware of, of this, but um, it it it's sort of shocking that we didn't learn the first lesson from sanctions in terms of Iraq um, 30 years ago, I guess now, but uh, I right. appreciate your, your joining us. Well, it's a pleasure being with you, Sam. Thank you. Thank you Bye -bye. for such good questions. You've done your homework. No oh, doubt about well, it. Thank you. You've been following it. this. <laughs> uh, we have a little bit. All right. Well, thank you very much.